It's my pleasure to welcome Mboyo Esele of Northeastern University, who will speak to us today about push forward and Euler characteristic of crepent resolutions of Weierstrass models. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to talk here. The first time I was here for a seminar, it was Paolo Alufi, who was actually talking about some of the foundation work that allow us to produce this work. And so this is a work in collaboration with uh, Monica Kahn, who is sitting first row here, and uh, Patrick Jefferson. So they are both graduate students uh, in the, the physics department at Harvard. So they took uh, um, classes of uh, algebraic geometry with me, and now they are like uh, Algebraic geometry ninjas. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the, the topic of the talk is a very natural story when you are interested in uh, elliptic vibration. Uh, so I'm going to first uh, give uh, some background um, of the, the history of the topic. So the study of elliptic vibration started relatively late even though uh, elliptic curves themselves were known for a while. So it really started in uh, uh, the 1960s with uh, the work of Kodaira, not far away from here. So Kodaira was working on uh, the classification of algebraic surfaces, and he was using uh, what is now called the Kodaira dimension. And so it happens that the case of uh, elliptic surfaces has to be studied as a particular case. So what is uh, an elliptic surface? So that will be um, a map from uh, a surface to a, a curve, such that the generic fiber is a projective curve of genius one with a choice of a point. Uh, in reality, what Kodera did was more general than that, so he didn't assume there were a section. So he worked with what we will really call genius one vibration. So in his uh, classification uh, of surfaces, he did two different things. So one thing was to uh, try to understand what is the structure of an elliptic surface. But clearly, if you have a generic fiber, what it means is that you have your curve and you have your fiber, which is a smooth cubic that just like a smooth uh, elliptic curve that just moves. And eventually, there are a few points where your fiber might become singular. And the singularity are really uh, the story about uh, this type of uh, uh, structure. So, for example, uh, the other characteristic of uh, elliptic curve, so this is like a torus, is equal to zero. So, if you try to think of what would be the other characteristic of an elliptic surface, you will see that you will have only contribution from singular fibers. And not all singular fibers have the same Euler characteristic. So depending on the singularity you have, you end up having different answers. So there is another point of view on this question uh, that happened more or less at the same time, but this time in uh, number theory. So that was more like around 1963. And this is the work of uh, André Néron in his PhD thesis. Uh, he studied uh, what we call now wire stress models. So when you study um, curves in algebraic geometry, you learn about uh, the riemann roch theorem. And one of the usual exercises that you have in your first p set, they ask you to prove that if you have a curve of genius one 
with a, a, a rational point, it can be put in the following form in terms of uh, a cubic equation that I can summarize like this. Where basically here, x, y, z had the projective coordinate of a P2. And so, so this is, this basically just describes like a smooth elliptic curve. There is a discriminant locus that tells you where, in which case, your curve could be singular. So when delta is zero, it means that you have a singular curve. So from that point of view, it's very easy to see how you could define an equation that actually represents an elliptic surface. Because all you have to do is to let f and g depend on the parameter. So for every value of f and g, you have a certain type of elliptic curve. And elliptic curves are characterized by what you call the j-invariant. And in this case, uh, the j-invariant of an equation like this take a very simple form. So you see that uh, when the discriminant is zero, the gen variant might be infinite, but obviously if f is also zero, you might have different values. So typically, uh, when you have singular fiber, they will have a gen variant infinity of gen variant 70, 28, or zero. And smooth fiber, the gen variant can really be any a complex number. So, um, so, so now, uh, let's try to give the first example of an elliptic surface. So I'm just going to take uh, my curve to be uh, just uh, the affine line. So this is spec of t. So I have a parameter t um, that define where I sit on the curve. And for each value of t, I want to be able to uh, get a different elliptic curve. And so I can write the following equation, where here I let f be a function of t, and g be a function of t as well. So I really like cartoons. So every time I write something like this, I have a visual image of it. And my visual image for this equation is uh, you have this line parameterized by t. And on top of that line, for each value, you have a torus, so you have a genus 1 curve with a point. And as you move, t basically change the shape of the curve. So the curve is like briefing. So the curve is briefing. So it takes like different shape. And uh, sometimes the curve really becomes singular. So you can develop like a, a curve, uh, a nodal curve like this, which basically is obtained by shrinking. <laughs> yes, like you can have like a medical emergency. <laughs> so you can have that. And the locus where this happens are exactly the locus where your discriminant is zero. Okay, so to give a, another example, let's say that uh, our curve is actually um, a rational curve, so a P1. So this gives a little bit more structure because then I actually have to decide what type of polynomial are f and g. So here I start to have to think about the global structure of uh, this object. And so in this case, like, what do we do? So there is a very beautiful answer to this that was developed uh, by uh, people like uh, Mumford, Tate, and Delin, which is basically just to describe the relative case of a wire stress model, where here, you see, uh, I was pretending that uh, x, y, z we're just living uh, in a projective plane. But in reality, when my base is compact, I cannot do that. 
I have to introduce a projective plane that is also brief in with the curve. So uh, the picture would be the following. So you have uh, your curve, and I have to define my scene. So I have a P2 that kind of like is living his own life over there. And inside that P2, I can draw an elliptic curve. So this is the idea of a projective bundle. And the projective bundle is a very natural uh, notion in uh, geometry. Since we do most of our computation in projective space, having a projective space that just move around seems to be right. Yes? Just a quick question about these two. Uh, these double points occur one, one at a time. Uh, so it have like, two curves collapsing at the same time? Okay. So yes, you can have uh, fibers that I mean, this equation will not show you that, right. but you can have singularity that after resolution will give you more complicated fibers. But they, so the wild stress model really only have nodal and cusp, a singular fiber. But after resolution of singularity, which is actually what we want to talk about today, you can have more sophisticated object. So, okay, so here I was talking about the notion of uh, uh, projective bundle. For the better or the worse, so this notion was really uh, well defined by uh, the Brobaki school. So people have like a different way to think about it. So for me, when I write, if I start with a, a vector bundle over a base, when I write P of V, uh, what it means is fiber by fiber, you take the projectivization. And uh, in my notation, I take uh, the projectivization of lines. So I think of a projective space as a collection of lines and not a collection of hyperplane. This usually doesn't really matter until you start doing intersection theory, because then you might end up like a sign that is moving all over the place. It can be disturbing. So, okay. So in this situation, uh, how do we uh, formalize the notion of a Weierstrass model. So there is a really cute paper uh, written by Dolin. And it has a French name. The paper is really nice. So it's called the formulaire. And so I think the story was um, there was a school in Antwerpen. Antwerpen is a city in Belgium. They have a port, they have diamonds, and they had a seminar with the Ling and Tate. And Tate was uh, talking about the elliptic curve and his uh, convention were introduced by the Ling. So he wrote a little paper where he said, uh, formulaire sur les courbes elliptiques d'après uh, Tate, which means it's a, how do you say formulaire in English? Formulary? It's pattern or it's the... It's a list it's a, of... It's a list of things that should happen. I mean, yes. Yeah. So basically, it's just the notation. And here, he, he explained how you can construct uh, a projective bundle and then how you can turn any uh, elliptic vibration into a hypersurface in a projective bundle. For the English version, there is a book by um, Mumford and, and uh, Swamenem where they basically, in the last section, as more like an exercise, they do this in a very elegant way. And so the notion is the following. You need to introduce a line bundle that will basically determine everything else. So let's say we start with B, um, a projective variety. So here I'm always going to work over the complex and then we let L over B be a line bundle. And then what we do is we define our ambient space that I call X0 to be the projectivization of the following. To be, and I'm going to call the map uh, pi. 
So, so basically, this is a vector bundle. I take its projectization. So I have a P2 bundle that moves everywhere. And I'm going to define coordinates, so the relative coordinate. So by this, I mean uh, along the fiber. So the fiber is a P2, and I can use this coordinate x, y, z. But this time, x, y, and z are actually section of line bundles. So first of all, because the fiber is a P2, I can define O minus 1, which is uh, the tautological line bundle of x0. So this is a line bundle that, uh, on every fiber, basically represents the line bundle that you get when you take a projective space. And uh, O1 is uh, the dual of O minus 1. So for example, projective coordinates have to be section of O1. And so in this setting, x, y, and z are going to be section of the following uh, line bundles. We'll have that uh, x is a section of uh, O1 and the pullback of L2. Y would be a section of O1 times the pullback of L cube. And Z will just be a section of O1. And now my equation, the defining equation, is a section of O3 L6. And so I'm going to give you some intuition for this. So all the scaling that you see here have really come in just from the riemann rock uh, equation. And the, the reason why they make sense is that the fact that we have an O3 here means that in each fiber, the equation is actually a cubic equation. So, so meaning a cubic equation with this scaling under restriction that it's L6. For example, we have coefficient of the type zy square. So this is cubic. And in terms of L, it's a section of L6. Then you can have coefficient like uh, Lxz. You can have coefficient like uh, yz square, x cubed. Uh, x squared z, x z squared, and z cube. And the formula basically normalizes what we call the coefficient. Um, and all this coefficient, a section, of Li. And then you see that the equation is homogeneous with respect to all the scaling. So if you scale with a fiber, it's just a cubic equation. And a cubic equation defines a curve of genus 1. And uh, the fact that there is a scaling with respect to L basically reproduce uh, the type of pole you expect from the Riemann rock. And so the proof that you can put any uh, elliptic vibration with a section in this form is really composed of two parts. There is one part which is just Riemann rock on each fiber. Then you have to do a little bit of a base change theorem to explain how this is consistently uh, possible when you have uh, blue wind patches. And that's all that <laughs> is. So uh, you, you see that this equation is more complicated than it could be because I could, for example, complete the square in Y and complete uh, the cube uh, in x. But what is nice with this one is that you can do it over uh, any uh, field that you want. And then, uh, since we said that we work over the complex number, we can always rewrite it like this uh, after appropriate change uh, of variable. 
Well, this time, f would be a section of uh, L4, and g would be a section of L6. So it's easy to find that because you know the equation is 6. For example, this is x times f times x. x take a contribution 2, so you're left over with 4 because z has contribution 0. So this is how you get it. So then your discriminant locus would be, uh, let me just repeat the definition of uh, the discriminant locus, would be a section of L12. So now that we have this, let's go back to our example. The case when the base is just a P1. So if your base is just a P1, you basically need to choose L as you want. Line bundle over P1 are all of the same type. So L would be OP1 of some number N, meaning uh, the section of L are polynomial of degree N. Then um, you know that uh, F would be then a polynomial of degree for n, and g would be a polynomial of degree 6n, and delta would be a polynomial of degree 12n. So for example, if, uh, because this is a curve, any equation on a curve gives you a set of points. So for example, I can now ask you the question, how many singular fiber I should expect on an elliptic vibration over a P1? How many? 24 times n, 12 times n, sorry. So uh, generically, we have two n singular fibers. And they are all nodal curves. This would be like the generic case. The correct one are using homogeneous components and two coordinates or using um, so, homogeneous one? No, 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 homogeneous. And, and so what coordinates are you, are you calling them? So I didn't need to make a choice, but let's say if you say that uh, your P1 is parameterized by uh, uh, alpha and beta, then F and G are polynomial of this degree in alpha and beta. Two or Oh, sorry. 12, 12 right. Because uh, in the generic case, what all you will have is just delta equals zero. So the definition of a nodal curve is exactly that. So if you want nodal, would be uh, uh, that delta is zero and f and g and not simultaneously zero. And also the valuation of delta should be one. So there is no high multiplicity point there. And by the way, uh, if you look at the nodal curve, it's easy to compute the Euler characteristic of a nodal curve because you can think of it as a, so you have this nodal curve, you remove the singular point, so you can think of it as a cylinder plus a point. Then the log characteristic of a cylinder is zero, point is one, so you have a log characteristic one. So then you can deduce that in the generic case, the log characteristic of uh, um, an elliptic surface with L equal OP1N, it's just going to be the sum of the contribution from the nodal, the nodal curve. So this is like a computation by cutting and pasting. So I want to compute. I know that I only get contribution from singular fiber. They are all of the same type. So the number of singular fiber do the work for me. So now, in reality, elliptic vibration are complicated. So you don't have like scenario like this. So I'm going to show you how the fiber can become involved. 
So let, let's assume we define our fiber by a cubic. So you start with a smooth fiber. It can degenerate into a nodal curve or it can degenerate into a cusp. So now this nodal curve, because it's a cubic, you know that you have a three equal two plus one, which means a cubic can degenerate into a conic and a line. Then the conic can go into a, a, a limit in which uh, it becomes the intersection of a conic and a tangent line. But then you can also degenerate the conic into two lines and get a triangle. And both of these guys can go to a situation where all the three points join as one intersection. And finally, this guy could degenerate into a line and a double line, and eventually a triple line. So if you have something like that, let's say you have a higher dimensional base, computing the Euler characteristic of this will mean considering all this contribution. This one doesn't happen if you have a section. Because otherwise, the section will have intersection free with this fiber, which is not possible. But you have enough drama here to have like a mathematical soap opera. And it's going to be a mess to do it, to compute the other characteristic of this. So what you would like is to have a way to do this computation in a much more systematic way in a way that does not really depend on what is happening in the life of the elliptic vibration. But if I give you some data, like what is L and what is B, you would like to have a formula that summarizes everything. And if possible, you would like a formula that works regardless of the dimension of the base. Because if you look at this, if I have a base of dimension one, I might just worry about what happens up to here. If my base has dimension two, I might go to co-dimension two, and so on. So I want to avoid discriminating against dimension. We are in Massachusetts. We don't discriminate. So we want a formula that works over every base. And so this is what I'm going to show you. Before to do that, uh, I'm going to give you some motivation why, uh, obviously, Monica, she's a uh, a student in physics, if she's doing this, probably there is like a physics related motivation as well. So I'm going to explain. So, so the singular fibers of uh, an elliptic vibration uh, are of uh, a type that is seen all over mathematics, the ADE linking di diagram. Let's first look at the case of surface. They have dual graph. That are affine. ADE. Dinkin. Diagram. So I'm not going to draw them all, but I'm going to draw some of them. So for example, we discuss a fiber that looks like a triangle like this. The dual graph is uh, the affine Dickin diagram A2. Uh, you can have a fiber that looks like a double curve that meets four. Each, each line that I draw is a P1, it's a rational curve. So this dual graph would be a D4. And there are cases where you can have the same Dinkin diagram for different type of fibers. It happens very few time, and it happens only for those curves that have very few components. So for example, um, two curves intersecting the two points will have the same Dinkin diagram that when they are tangent to each other. So this will just be a, a one. And also the triangle and the star uh, they also just A2. Okay? And um, you, you also have more exotic one. Uh, my favorite one is uh, uh, the one that corresponds to the affine E6. And um, 
it takes the following form. And the dual graph here is this. Yeah, I should not may have favorite because I also like this one very much. Um, I will explain why I like these two guys a lot. Yes? I don't get totally lost here. So this, you're talking about the people bundled over uh, yeah. So you, you have a, you start with a P two bundle. And these are curves in that yes. After resolution of singularities, you so your wave stress model needs to have singularity to produce this curve. So I will explain in, in a minute. This one, but these two guys can be obtained even like let me just draw like an example. So let's say. Um, I write an equation uh, like this. Okay, so this is a cubic. It moves uh, and it's a smooth elliptic curve, but when t is zero, it's split into three lines. That's an example. So that's not a worst worst model. If I start with a worst worst model, I will need to have a singularity to produce something like that. So I'll, I'll do it in a minute, actually. No, 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 no. Why? Because uh, the fiber can have singularities without the total space to be singular. So it's okay for the fiber to have this type of intersection. The total space is still going to be smooth. Okay. Yeah, always, uh, this happens even with a sphere. You, you cut your sphere and uh, you have circles and you do have singular fibers that are points. So it doesn't change the fact that it's smooth. Okay, so, so now uh, clearly when you have Dinkin diagrams like this, you can think that uh, for, like it, it means different things for different people. But in physics, when you start seeing a Dinkin diagram, you immediately think of gauge theories. So uh, in string theory, elliptic vibration, are instrumental in what they call the geometric engineering of gauge theories. So gauge theories is basically what physics use to describe the world as we know it. So it describes interaction between particles and the data of a gauge theory, at least some of the data of a, a gauge theory are the following. So you have to choose a Lie algebra. You have to choose a Lie group. The two are not, are not the same. You can have uh, the, same, uh, the same Lie algebra and different Lie group. And you can have a representation of uh, the Lie algebra. So this type of data they are totally uh, computable from an elliptic vibration. So uh, I will explain. So now there the is, before to start talking about how we attack this problem, there are a few like basic notion of uh, geometry that uh, play a very important role here and are usually not appreciated enough. So. Uh, Let's talk about uh, um, the notion of uh, geometric irreducibility. So 
what does it mean to be geometrically irreducible? The best way to appreciate that is to look at an example. So consider uh, the following conic in the affine plane. So I'm writing a conic, and my affine plane is parametrized by x and y, and I'm writing a, an equation like this one. So what does it represent? So it represents a conic, it has degree two, but is it okay for me to say that these are two lines because I can take the square root It really depends if I am able to take the square root or not. So over the A line, so if A is just a parameter, I'm not allowed to just take its square root. So in that case, uh, let's call this curve C. C is not, C, sorry, C is irreducible. So if I cannot take the square root of A, this is an irreducible curve. However, it is not geometrically irreducible. Why? Because I can do a field extension. And after a field extension, it will split. So this notion is very important. Like field extension, I like giving you like superpower to kind of see more details in your geometry. And notions that survive after you do any field extension you want are usually called geometric. And so let me show you examples. So you notice that I did mention only ADE thinking diagram. And one natural question is to ask what about the non-simply list thinking diagram? They're also there when you take into account this notion. Uh, so the, the fiber that I was represented so far, I mentioned, I, I, I didn't mention these are geometric fibers. So that means this is what you see after you do whatever field extension you need to, to split all the curve. But if you're not able to do the field extension, you have much more degree of freedom. So let's try to look at an example, the geometric fiber. that we call I star zero and whose dual graph is uh, the affine d So this diagram looks like this. And the way it is produced, you have these three lines that are coming from a cubic. So you can think of it in the following sense. I have a P1 cross a P1. And here I have, a, let's say this depends on the parameter T. I have an equation that depends on T, which is a cubic equation. So if I can factor this cubic, I can basically distinguish these three nodes that basically sit here. And this is what I have. But it's also possible that I can only factor one element of the cubic, and then these two nodes are basically a conic like the one I draw here. So in this sense, this diagram would be represented like this with a double line and an arrow that indicates the part that contain, it's like an inequality that tells you where you have the most. And so now you realize that this is a non-simply list thinking diagram. There is also another possibility. I can actually not split anything at all. So here you have D4 when you can actually split all the free curve. But if you can not split them at all, you will have three nodes that are together and this is exactly uh, like uh, I write it twisted G2. And why? Because if you write 
the carton of this is the transpose of the regular affine G2. And finally, uh, I will show what happens for um, two more diagrams. So the diagram of type E6 also has the property that these guys are coming from conics. And so if these conics do not split, you will produce um, a diagram like this. which is a twisted F4. And like this, you can produce all of them. So the reason why I'm mentioning this diagram is that assume that they are actually moving in your elliptic vibration. The divisor that each of these nodes create would be completely different if they can split or not. And so these affect the other characteristic. So, okay, so now we are ready to get uh, more technical. Um, yes? So you think all the, the diagrams are accounted for by these various electric vibrations? Yes. They are all accounted for, and you can give uh, an explicit construction for each one. So I want to uh, build... Um, like to, to give an example of how you can produce something like that from like a simple singularity. So let's say um, I'm going to introduce a singular wire stress model and the singularity would be um, due to uh, the high multiplicity of this guy. So this is over the T line. So I'm writing an equation like this. And so this equation, let's call this curve E, is singular at the ideal x, y, t. And you can see that every single of the monomial are at least quadratic in x, y, t, meaning there is a singularity. So when you have a singularity like that, you can do a Crepin resolution by doing a very simple blow up and you can blow up the ideal x, y, t. So when you blow up this ideal, the simple description of the blow up is really just like a rescaling. You can say that, okay, um, I am, so, so typically when you want to introduce a blow up like this, what you do, you introduce a P2 with coordinate that I'm going to call alpha, beta, gamma. And then you ask this matrix to have rank one. And this basically tells you that the two rows are proportional to each other. So in another way, I could say that x is uh, actually, these are bad names. I'm going to call that x bar y bar, t bar. So x would be, they are proportional with the same parameter. So I can have this and e1 here give me uh, my exceptional divisor. So when I am away from the singularity, so if one of these guys is non-zero, this is basically just an isomorphism, so nothing happened at all. But if all of them are zero, I absolutely need E1 to be zero because these are projective coordinates. So if you compute the proper transform of this equation, so the proper transform means, you, in this case, it's very easy to compute. You just plug this in there you pull out as many power of E than you can, and then you see what is left. And in this case, it's a very easy. Um, your equation will take the following form. Uh, 
And now you can see the presence of multiple fibers in the following way. Before, uh, we had the singular fiber was a t equal zero. And a t equal zero, all we had was just like a cusp. We had an equation like this, which is the equation of a cusp. After the blow up, t is replaced by t1 by t bar e1. So now you see that you have two components. And each of them contribute in its own way. So when you look at t bar equals 0, so this will give you a curve C0, which is just the normalization of the curve. And when you put E1 to 0, uh, you put E1 to 0, you see that you have an equation like this. Uh, so this is a square here. And so this, you can split into two lines, OK? And now if you see how all these curves intersect, you see that they intersect exactly like a free star. So this one basically will give you y plus minus t bar. And they have one intersection point, And you produce this fiber. And so all the other fiber are produced by doing more complicated blow up. And here, as you see, I was careful to not put a parameter here. But if I did, I would not be able to split them. And then in that case, what I will have is really, like if you think of this as like free P1 that meet at one point, if I don't do the split, I will actually have these two that are geometrically uh, reducible. And my point is that the other characteristic of a variety that has this behavior and the one that has this other behavior are completely different. OK. So now um, I can explain the, the idea of how you compute uh, the other characteristic of such object. So if, when you study a lock characteristic or churn classes in general, the, they are really beautiful theorem of the type index theorem. So these are theorem that give you result without really getting into a fight with the geometry. It's like, I always think of it like, I am Napoleon Bonaparte, I sit on top of the mountain, I guide my troops and I can destroy all the armies without really getting into the battle. That's kind of the idea. So you have um, um, which one? How do I want to call this? Uh, okay, so let's call it uh, the Poincaré Hopf theorem. So what the Poincaré Hopf theorem tells you is that if you want to compute the Euler characteristic of a variety x, all you have to do is compute the degree of the top chunk class. So the top chunk class is essentially the chunk class of the tangent bundle of x, and you take the degree with respect to x. So this is the formula we want to do. But now the problem is that our x is difficult to obtain because we start with something that has a lot of singularities and that needs to go through uh, some blow-ups. And we say that x is a crepered resolution. of a singular wire strass. 
So what does it mean? It means that you start with uh, a singular variety and the x that you have has the following property. So this is uh, the definition of a crepant resolution. So you need phi to be a proper map, a proper morphism. And the idea is that it would be a proper morphism such that x is smooth, non-singular. This is really cool. <laughs> it's like as if you were on a boat. Yeah. So, so these two conditions will be too, too mild. Like if X is just smooth and then you have a proper map, the idea is you want to, to preserve as much as possible from the singular geometry. So you impose the condition that phi is an isomorphism away from the singular locus of x singular. So if you're away from the singularity of x, x is exactly the same thing. You don't see any difference. And then this is enough to be a, quite like a strong form of a resolution. But uh, because here we're also interested in physics, we ask for a more uh, stronger condition. We ask that the canonical class of x is the pullback of the canonical class of x singular. So obviously, uh, if I'm computing the canonical class of x singular, it means it has a certain type of singularities. So for example, you need to be able to talk about the canonical class. So the wire source model has that property. It's an hypersurface. Uh, it has the singularity that are normal. And those that we consider, they admit crepant resolution. So, so this basically tells you, for example, that if you start with a Calabiao variety, after the resolution, your variety is still Calabiao. So these conditions uh, are extremely strong. So now, uh, the reality of uh, resolving singularity is that it's not as if every uh, singular variety only have one possible resolution. So in general, what you have is the following situation. So you start from a singular variety, and you can produce many crepant resolution. But then these crepant resolution are related by map that are called flops. So meaning you, you can, so these are different resolution They can be non-isomorphic, they all crepant. No, 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 flops, because I have this condition. Yeah, flips will require a curve to behave slightly differently. So now, in physics, flops are very natural transformation. So if you do your physics with this one and you flop it to this one, you preserve a lot of the details of the physics. And so for physicists, it was very natural to assume that the Euler characteristic of all these guys should be the same. It was a, a conjecture of physics that was actually proven by Batirev. So Batirev has a theorem that if you have two varieties related by a flop that are crepant resolution of the same uh, singular variety, then the Euler characteristic is an invariant. So this is what is called a string invariant, meaning it's an invariant on the flop. It, preser it is preserved under a brutal transformation allowing your theory. And the proof of Batirev is really beautiful. So he Basically, to prove this, uh, he used uh, um, a periodic 
geometry. So, so, the, so this is like the beginning of uh, the discussion of motifs in this setting with geometry. And uh, obviously, uh, if Batirev did something like that, there is somebody called Konsevich that can come in and uh, do something better. Uh, OK, so here I should not misspell the name. Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. Okay, so Konsevich went even further. He explained that uh, uh, for Calabi house, the Hodge numbers of x1 and x2 are the same. So, so, okay, so now you see that this is like a huge opportunity because you have all these fibers defined by Codera symbols and you can ask yourself for each one of them, what is the Euler characteristic? And now, Batirev tells you that the, the question is very well defined because you just need to find one crepent resolution, do your computation in that crepent resolution and that will be the same for everything. And when you call BR, you can even do it for Hodge numbers. So that's exactly what we did. So um, the idea of our paper is the following. So we have the following structure. You start with a base, you produce uh, the projective bundle in which you write your geometry. And this, inside this setting, you have uh, some variety X that is singular but then you produce a crepent resolution um, of x. And this is uh, the usual projection. So what we do is we basically compute the Euler characteristic in the following way. To compute the Euler characteristic of x, we look at uh, the top churn class or the degree of uh, its uh, total churn class in homology. So we are a big fan of uh, Fulton here. And then we use the property of push forward. So meaning if I want to compute this, after the resolution is quite messy, I have a lot of exceptional divisor. So what I do is I push it to the next step. But here, I'm not doing the computation in the singular variety. I'm doing it in the ambient space. So meaning this is the same as pushing forward this expression and basically computing everything in what I used to call x0, my ambient space. So finally, here I am inside a projective bundle and I have another map pi. And I finally push forward everything and my result will live in the base. And the non-trivial part is to actually explain how you can do this map. And that's the core of uh, our paper. So now I will express what type of result you get when you do this. And so, okay. So what you get is extremely, I find it extremely elegant. It's kind of weird when you say that about uh, one of your own paper. <laughs> But you know, everyone writes many papers and there are papers that uh, you know are good and there are papers that you know are really good in the sense that you've been looking for such a result in a long time, you couldn't find anything like this. And then when you finally get it, it's even more beautiful than what you expected to have. I would have settled for half of this. So first of all, the case of a, a smooth wire stress model,
So I'm going to need like three minutes to finish. <laughs> Thank you. So for the case of a wire stress model that is smooth, I actually gave a talk just on this case that now seems to be so irrelevant because it doesn't have all this extra structure. And the result, you remember that the worst west model is defined from a line bundle L. And here, I'm going to call capital L the first term class of that line bundle. And in that case, the Euler characteristic is produced by the following generating function. And so the way you interpret this expression is that this is the total trend class. So C of TB is basically 1 plus C1 of TB, C2 of TB, and so on. And you think of it as a polynomial. So I could put uh, a parameter T here. This is like the trend polynomial. And this expression is analytic in T. And you can basically compute its expansion. I can write the leading term, which is 12L, and so on. So this connects us to our example we had before. If L is uh, the line bundle ON, you have 12 times L, because you have to take the degree. Okay? And so this is the smooth case of uh, Weierstrass model. By the way, so this is a result of uh, Paolo Alufi and myself from uh, a long, long time ago. And we were really happy, it by the way. That long ago. How long ago? I mean, 2009. <laughs> yes, a long, long time ago. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so when we had this result, we were really happy because one thing that uh, you have to appreciate here, this formula doesn't tell you what is the dimension of y. It works for any dimension. So you just do the expansion and you pick up the term of the correct dimension, and it's given by a nice rational expression. So now I'm going to give, to give you a flavor of what happened, I'm going to give you the example for the fiber we constructed uh, that are obtained by triangles like that. So what I mean by this is that uh, take a divisor S inside your base, and then, so you have, you start from a base B, you have a divisor S, and you say that the generic fiber over S is such uh, a fiber. So you have a certain equation that allow you to have that. And so this is also going to be true for this case. And for this case, I actually wrote the equation. So if we, let's use what we know. So if you use this, it means that you are looking at an elliptic vibration that take the following form. And this elliptic vibration is singular, so the variety S here is the vanishing local of S. So if you resolve this singularity, you have this elliptic vibration. And by doing this double push forward, with um, the heart of the theorem is very technical, but is a result that you can actually trace back to Jacobi. So when we were doing the paper, there were one technical formula that we find that you can see in a Jacobi thesis from like 8025, which is purely a combinatoric fact. But this combinatoric fact allow you to really control your push forward uh, in a very elegant way. Did you actually look and copy this? In Latin, nice. you know, I. I'm Catholic, I went to, you know, I know how to do my prayer in Latin, so I can read it. And I, I went to the physics, I, I sent the physics to my student, and they were like, wow, you crazy. But anyway, so this was a good moment. So this geometry um, has the following Euler characteristic. So remember that L here is the first term class of the line bundle L. And so here, if I say that S is the vanishing locus of S, I really think of S as a Cartier divisor. So S is a section of a certain line bundle S. 
and I'm going to call S the first strong class of that line bundle. Then the other characteristic of this, take the following very nice expression. Time the trend class of the base. So, so now this formula is much nicer than it should be. And if you start doing expansion, you see that, let's say you want to do it for a surface, then it's always easy because it will be travel. If you do it for anything else, it becomes extremely complicated because of uh, the complexity hidden in this trend class. And string theories, because they have a lot of dualities, they have way to compute complicated stuff without actually doing any computation. And they had a prediction for what would be the Euler characteristic of all the elliptic vibration whose dual fiber are inside E8. Because they have the heterotic string, which has this symmetry E8. So by using string duality, they had conjecture and for Calabi-Alf. And this formula reproduced this prediction, and all the other predictions are reproduced correctly, except for one, where I assume they just make a string theory typo for E8 itself. But for all the subgroup, all these formula were reproduced. So the general form that we get is always a rational function of L, of L and S times the total chunk class. of the base, and uh, this rational function has an initial condition that if you take S to be zero, it will produce what you get for the smooth wire stress model, which is kind of what you would expect. And the, the heart of this result is something that is more important than the log characteristic because it tells you how your intersection number change when you do like a, a push forward computation. So you do a blow up and you want to project the show ring back to the original space. And we have a, a nice formula to do it. When your blow up consists, has a center that consists of a hyperplane that intersect transversely. And it happens that for Wildstrass model, the blow up I did for this, if you remember, was uh, really nothing complicated. It was uh, an ideal made of uh, monomial, regular monomials. And by only using regular monomial, we were able to produce crepant resolution for all the type of Tate models. So this list, um, the, the way I think about it is, you give me an elliptic vibration of any dimension, you choose one Dinkin diagram, and there is a, a power series that tells you what happened with this uh, Euler characteristic. And for the case of calabi yau we also computed Hodge number of all cases. So this is uh, something that is now down, and uh, we are looking uh, to the next episode. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. So what, what, is it, what is interesting is it depends on the dual graph of the generic fiber over the divisor S, but also because it's really a result based on pushing forward blow-ups, let's say you have different fibers that are resolved by the same sequence of blow-up, they end up having the similar characteristic. So to give you a, an example, geometry like a, uh, A2 or uh, G2 or uh, C2, they have very different Dinkin diagram, but their resolution is exactly the same. And so from our point of view, it was direct that they have the similar characteristic in any dimension. Whereas if you think of how the fiber degenerate in each case, it's completely different. You will, if you do the other characteristic by cutting and pasting, the fact that they have the similar characteristic will come as a huge surprise 
it will be like why they are so different and they have the same Euler cartes. It's because they are obtained by the same sequence of blow-ups. And since our formula only requires knowing the sequence of blow-up and not the detail of the fiber, now it's trivial. How do you know that the resolution is correct when it's because of the kinds of blow-ups you're using? Yeah, so this is actually very easy when you do blow-ups that are monomial because what happens is you actually blow up in uh, the ambient space and you have a simple formula that tells you how the canonical class change after a blow up. But then when you compute the proper transform, you have to factor out some power of the exceptional divisor. And the power that you factor out, they just compensate the change. So when you use a junction, uh, you have uh, the same equation. So for example, if you blow up an idea like this of length three, and your singularity is a double point, it's going to be crepent. And so for each sequence, we check crepency uh, because that's otherwise the formula loses its charm because it becomes too particular. So, sorry, so what I mean is you have these three parameters are not related by any relation. So you, you, they could define a complete intersection by themselves. And so when you do the blow up, and for example, you compute the canonical class after blowing up this guy, you will remove uh, minus two, the exceptional divisor. Then uh, your singularity itself is actually a double point singularity. So this means that you're also removing two exceptional divisor from the defining equation. So when you do the, the adjunction, the change in the ambient space is compensated by the loss of exceptional divisor in the main equation. And it's, this is the reason why you have a crepent resolution. So it's really much like for surfaces when you do a double point singularities. It's a generalization. Are there other questions? Yeah, yeah there's this work somehow related to the Yao's uh, slope formula? Uh, not that I can see. Actually, before I even say, which one do you have in mind? Well, um, I suppose it's for, for families of curves on the Kalabi Yao. And the no. So, so this is not at all, yeah, it will not at all be re related to it because. Um, it doesn't depend on the family of curve. So obviously this resolution gives you a curve that moves in family, but these are only uh, the relative, the curve for the fiber, but it doesn't tell you what happened in the base. So you can have like a lot of very different structure of family of curve if you look at the total space that will not be affected because this is a, a product. So you really, do not see uh, the details of, uh, of the base. So this polynomial itself is really due to the sequence of uh, crepent blow up. And so by the way, for us, we obtain our crepent resolution using blow up of monomial ideals. If for some reason you manage to have a resolution of blow up of crazy ideals, it doesn't matter because they will be related by a flop. And so the final result will be the same. The detail will be much more complicated, but the final result will be the same. So what we did was really to try to follow the path of lowest resistance. So for each case, we just try to write the simplest sequence, even though we might end up blowing up more than we should. But we just go for the simplest path. In your abstract, did you mention a way of computing uh, Euler characteristics of, of projective bundles, the new way? Yes, so what we have is uh, two results. So when we do our computation of uh, push forward in projective bundle, um, we really just use the, the functorial property of the Segre class. The Segre class has very strong functorial properties, so we use them 
to try um, to derive formula without using the dimensionality. Maybe I'll, I'll show a quick example uh, to illustrate that point. So, so let's say you consider a projective bundle with a map pi. Uh, so one thing you can do is compute uh, um, the Segre class of the O1 of this. Let's say I call the generator H, so I will have an expression like this, that when it's pushed forward, it has to reproduce the churn class of the vector bundle. So what we do is we basically use this type of equation to try to write the push forward of an analytic function of H without actually trying to do an expansion. So we have formula of the type, depending on the vector bundle you consider, like for the one of, uh, if you take for example V to be the one we use for wire stress model, uh, this push forward, Monica correct me when I make a typo, uh, would be uh, uh, obtained like this. So here you remove the linear part of H and then you evaluate at minus two and then you do the same thing with three. and you evaluate at minus three. So, so meaning normally people do expansion and they only have formula to how to push forward a certain <laughs> a power of H. But using this type of generic formula, you basically do not care what this function is. And for us, the function we use is typically the total churn class. And usually people will try to pick up the top churn class, we don't because the degree will basically take care of uh, selecting the correct dimension. So this is how we do not need to focus on the dimensionality of uh, our base. And so such results, let's say you are not interested in elliptic curve, but you're interested in another geometry that is also produced using projective bundle, you can just do exactly the same type of computation. So the, the technical result that produce our result has much more application than just a local artistic. In any uh, intersection theory setting, defining projective bundle, and that require doing blow up of a complete uh, intersection, you can basically do the same type of computation. I have a question. Yes. You said that your results agreed with what the physicist conjecture is, except in one case, which you assumed was a typo. Do they agree it's a typo? <laughs> <laughs> well, we can, so the, the way you check that we, who is right, so first of all, we have a proof they don't, but <laughs> more importantly, you can also just go back to work and do a computation by cutting and pasting. And then you see exactly what the geometry is telling you. It's more messy, well, not you, but I'm messy. Asking if they agree that you're right. Oh, um, we haven't <laughs> met them yet. Oh. Like, uh, but I think we didn't get any angry email, so we assume. <laughs> That's a good I talked to the post office. Oh, so they're aware of it, yes. So there is, um, yes. Do they, they agree it's probably a mistake? It's, so I looked, actually read their papers. It's quite clear. It's, it's a, Oh, yeah. Okay. So the problem when you do conjecture is that it's difficult to know when you make a typo. <laughs> so it's very difficult to know. But for us, uh, because each case was so different from their perspective, there is kind of like a, you have a unified. Yeah, they have like a unified way to think of each case. But for us, each case was a completely different computation. So the fact that we reproduce all their results except the one that where they had the less control was not really a surprise. So for, for, for a few days we thought the result was actually much wronger than that, but the <laughs> results were pretty solid. Well, also, they actually have the correct results, but they 
results somewhere in the paper, but they didn't think it's a very limiting case. Yeah, so it's not really, uh, I don't think it's a, it's a big deal to them. The, yeah. What matters was the lower rank group. And I was very surprised by the, the, the fact that the conjecture was actually right. My, so when I tell them about the paper, the idea was, how could they figure it out? And then you check, and you should never underestimate the power of physics intuition. Yeah. It's very powerful. All right, well, we should probably stop here. Uh, let's thank the speaker again.